Thanks so much for joining. We're going to give it another minute and let everybody come on who is uh, going to join us for this discussion. Welcome to our Secretary Speaker Series. Very glad that you've joined us. My name is Wade Crofin and I serve as our California Natural Resources Secretary, which means uh, I work on behalf of Governor Newsom and really all of our state leaders to drive what we think are world leading environmental policies. And I get to lead a big, broad agency comprised of over 26 departments doing that environmental conservation work uh, across the state. Um, many of you may be, this may be your first Secretary Speaker Series, and so I just want to share a little bit about what we do here. Essentially, this is a set of discussions that lift up big ideas, key priorities, and leaders that are driving progress across California and the, the world. And in fact, uh, today we have, we have one of those big thinkers with us. First of all, I want to wish everyone a happy Native American Heritage Month. We are really proud at our agency and across the Newsom administration to be celebrating this month, which provides us an opportunity to lift up our diverse Native American cultures across California and to underscore um, the work that we have to do as public agencies, building partnerships with tribal governments and communities and really lifting up tribal leadership to protect our environment. We know that, that Native American tribes have stewarded what we now know as California for tens, thousands of years. Uh, and we look to reconnect with that wisdom and support that leadership. Uh, and so uh, in the chat today, uh, we will be providing a bunch of different information and links that you can click on as you're listening to the conversation. And I believe one of the first uh, links that is being provided by my colleague Gita Chandra is uh, a website that provides information about events that were taking place this Native American Heritage Month. We've got events in person here in Sacramento and then a lot of virtual events, including another sec secretary's speaker series on traditional ecological knowledge and how it's shaping tribal advocacy. So once again, happy Native American Heritage Month. Um, during these discussions, again, we're gonna use the chat for information, sharing information, so I would leave that on. And then there's a button on the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button. And at any time during this discussion, if you want to pose a question or share an observation, you can do so. And that'll that'll come to me and the other panelists. And as we get into group conversation, we'll look to work your questions uh, into the dialogue. Our discussion today will be recorded. So you'll have an opportunity to circle back if it's helpful or share this recording with others. And within two days, you can find a recording of this discussion uh, on our website at resources.ca. Gov. So let's jump into our conversation. I am truly excited to have with us Ben Goldfarb, who is a uh, award-winning author, environmental journalist, and increasingly uh, a friend of mine. Welcome, Ben. Hey, Secretary Kerfoot. Kerfoot, how's it going? Good to see you. Oh, excited, excited to be here. Excited to be with you. Um, where are you zooming in from, by the way? You're not uh, right in front of a beaver pond. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. I, I try to spend as much time in, in front of beaver ponds as possible. But uh, right now, I'm in uh, I'm in Colorado, where I live. Awesome. Well, listen. A lot of us uh, first came to know your work either in the High Country News, where you were a journalist, or um, when you wrote uh, what I think is your first feature length book, uh, which is called Eager: The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. And I'll share with uh, folks today that this book. Uh, literally helped reshape California's approach to beaver uh, and the movement away from looking at beavers uh, as a pest and more as an ecosystem architect um, that we need as climate change accelerates. And Ben actually joined a previous speaker series when we were talking about uh, beavers. And I think Gita will share a link uh, of that discussion with Ben and others about beavers. And so when we had an opportunity to meet, uh, when, when, uh, when I interviewed you about this book, uh, you shared with me the fact that this other book, which is what we'll be discussing today, uh, was uh, coming out this fall. And of course, this book is called Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. 
And I was instantly over the moon because wildlife, wildlife connectivity is something that we're working on a big priority uh, here in California. So I, I asked you, maybe begged you, uh, to join us for a discussion once the book was out so you could share uh, your insights uh, from this work uh, with all of us. So first, I, I'd ask a question for you, Ben. Um, you know, what, what is road ecology? The subtitle of this book is How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of the Planet. So help us understand what road ecology is and how, how it helps describe the purpose of the book. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So road ecology is essentially the field of science that examines how roads and really all of our transportation infrastructure shape nature. And, you know, a lot of road ecology is sort of concerned with the most conspicuous, obvious manifestation of, you know, the interactions between roads and wildlife, which is roadkill, right? We've all seen the dead animal by the side of the highway. Uh, but that's really just the, the tip of the iceberg in a lot of respects, right? There's the barrier effect uh, that roads create, you know, the fact that this moving fence of traffic prevents animals from crossing highways at all and leads to genetic fragmentation, uh, you know, as has been demonstrated uh, with the mountain lions west of Los Angeles, very famously. You know, there's uh, the road noise issue which is really a form of habitat loss in its own right. There are tire particles that are killing coho salmon, uh, you know, in the Puget Sound watershed. There's road salt, uh, you know, running off uh, highways and, you know, turning freshwater ecosystems into brackish estuaries, essentially. So there are all of these different impacts that, that roads create. And road ecology is, the, the again, the field of study that tries to figure out all of those different relationships, and ideally, how to solve the problems that uh, that roads create. Wow! And in your book, you do a great job, sort of taking us through the history of of this sort of scientific area. And it sounds like there wasn't a lot of science. I mean, there were roadkill, uh, you know, tallies, uh, you know, a hundred years ago. But that this notion of road ecology really took shape in the '60s or '70s. It was that it was that long until there was that recognition. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I mean, certainly starting the 1920s, really, as cars begin to proliferate across the American landscape, you know, you've got biologists driving around, you know, counting dead garter snakes and uh, woodpeckers and ground squirrels and things. Uh, but you're, I think you're right. You know, really, it really is not until the 1960s and 70s that we start to take this problem seriously. And a, a big part of the reason for that is that you know it's not until kind of the middle of the century that deer really recover from, you know, being hunted nearly to extinction in the, in the 19th century. So as deer begin to sort of recolonize uh, the North American landscape, you know, suddenly there are these very common, large, uh, potentially dangerous animals intersecting with with uh, with with cars, uh, and so road ecology in some ways begins as really a, a human safety concern. Uh, you know, obviously we know that deer vehicle collisions are these really dangerous events. You know, they kill up to four hundred drivers every year. They're really expensive events. The average deer collision costs society more than nine thousand dollars in vehicle repairs and hospital bills and tow trucks and the rest of it. So that's really you know in some ways how road ecology takes off in the sixties and seventies. Is you know how do you solve this increasing urgent problem of collisions with deer and elk and moose and other large mammals that are starting to uh, recover across uh, the American landscape. Wow. I want to unpack these uh, the, these challenges with you, but I want you to bring us back to the beginning of this book because I understand it took years to write this book. What was the genesis of this book? And you know, what point did you really think that uh, this topic ultimately could be the topic of a full a full book? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. You know, I think I think that in a lot of ways, the origins of this book begin almost exactly a, a decade ago in uh, in the fall of 2013. I, I was uh, in Montana writing about habitat fragmentation and connectivity in the northern Rockies. Uh, and I had the chance to tour some wildlife crossings on Highway 93 north of uh, Missoula. And, you know, very appropriately for Native American Heritage Month, uh, you know, these crossings, are, they're very famous wildlife crossings, and they were built on the reservation of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, uh, you know, who had essentially insisted that, you know, the state and federal government include these wildlife crossings when they upgraded uh, and expanded Highway 93, uh, you know, for the sake of elk and deer and grizzly bears and all kinds of other uh, creatures. So I had the opportunity to tour a bunch of these crossings, which, you know, ran the gamut from little culverts for turtles to, you know, sort of 
capacious open span underpasses for uh, for deer and elk to you know sort of this giant beautiful uh, overpass that was built uh, largely for for grizzly bears. And I had a chance to go up on top of this overpass, and it was just a really beautiful, inspiring moment uh, on a couple of levels. First, you know, we, we do so much uh, on this planet to make wild animals' lives harder and more dangerous. And, you know, here was this multi-million dollar piece of infrastructure we built to make their lives easier and safer. And I thought that was, that was really moving. And then there was also the amazing intellectual challenge of it too, right? How do you create a piece of built infrastructure uh, that's appealing to a bobcat or a black bear or a mink or, you know, one of the, the whole sort of suite of species that, uh, you know, inhabits the, the northern Rockies. How do you create a structure that has all of the different habitat elements like vegetated screens and rock piles that, you know, rodents need to kind of hopscotch across the, uh, the overpass. So I just loved the intellectual challenge of being forced to essentially think like a wild animal in, in the course of infrastructural design. That fascinated me. Amazing. And, you know, we look to the Intermountain West uh, within the United States as a real leader on this. And I think we're proud to lead in a lot of ways in California, but in a, in a lot of ways that a lot of these states like Montana, Wyoming, and others have really been doing this for, seems like for, for quite a while uh, for these large mammals, these big game. Uh, is that fair to say? It is. Yeah. You know, I think the reason for that is that, you know, those intermountain West states like Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, you know, they tend to have migratory wildlife, right? They have these big herds of mule deer and elk and pronghorn moving across the landscape. And, you know, I think that that historically that that's made it really easy to know where the wildlife crossing should go, right? 10,000 mule deer cross, you know, Highway 30 in Wyoming and a hundred of them die. And there's a big pile of carcasses saying, hey, you know, put the wildlife crossing right here, right? So that's, you know, really starting in the, in the 1970s, you know, it's those intermountain west states that begin to build uh, crossings for these, you know, these migratory ungulate herds. Uh, and I think, you know, since then, the of the country has been learning from those those states. Yeah, and I love the I love the examples of where progress is being made. But you spend a lot of the early part of the book just talking about the scale of of the crisis. And two things I was struck by: one, to your point, when we think about you know animals getting struck by cars, we think about mammals. I grew up in the Midwest; deer strikes. But you talked about just the invisible toll on amphibians, for example, or, uh, or you know, reptiles, these animals that we just don't see. And so if you would talk a little bit about that. And then also this question around the reduction that roadkill and, and the roads impact on reducing the overall abundance of species. You know, we talk a lot about the biodiversity in California, and that's important. But roads have actually reduced the overall abundance or amount of animals. And that was also really sobering. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. You know, we tend to focus a lot on species extinction, right? The animals that vanish altogether. And we and we we think less, I think, about populations that gradually dwindle over time. And the species maybe still exists, but you know, at much lower levels uh than it than it historically did. And you know, certainly reptiles and amphibians, I think, are are perfect case studies uh for that, especially amphibians, you know, which tend to migrate, you know, certainly not long distances like deer and elk do, but you know, they undertake these seasonal seasonal treks from their upland forest habitat down to their their breeding ponds and wetlands and you know often those those little migrations cross roads because we build you know in low lying spots where it's easy to construct and that tends to be where water collects and where amphibians mate uh, and you know when you have you know, potentially thousands of frogs and salamanders crossing a highway on those, you know, warm, wet spring nights. I mean, the results can be catastrophic, you know, and, and uh, we're, we're losing these these animals uh, very quickly. Uh, you know, there's a the very famous uh, newt migration uh, near near Petaluma, you know, that's a, a, a big example of that, one of the largest sort of sources of or, or sort of mass mortality events in the in the country. Uh, and, you know, I think I think one of the challenges is that we haven't, you know, we haven't generally mitigated as much for those animals as we have for the large mammals, right? You know, transportation departments are pretty focused on human safety, which is understandable. That's, you know, a big part of their mission. So they tend to build wildlife crossings for those, you know, those large mammals that will mess your car up uh, when you hit them. But, you know, nobody's ever totaled their car on a, you know, a northern red-legged frog in in, uh, in Portland uh, or a spotted salamander, right? So, we you know, we tend to 
I think we, yeah, and again, I don't want to say this is true across the board because, you know, certainly we have mitigated um, for these animals. You know, there's that elevated road section for Yosemite toads in the Sierras that's that's very uh, a very famous example of amphibian mitigation. So, you know, these projects exist, um, but they're not nearly as common as they should be, I think, because, you know, we're still thinking primarily about driver safety, um, you know, rather than making that that conservation connection and recognizing that, hey, you know, we're, we're losing some of these small cryptic animals animals uh, because of our, our road system. Yeah. And I think about compared to when we were kids, you know, that there's a lot less bird song. There are a lot less insects, a lot less, you know, and so you make a point in the book that there in many places are a lot less animals writ large than there used to be. Yeah, that's, that's true. You know, and I think, I think that we, we tend to, I think we tend to overlook roads as, as you know, a, a very large reason for that. You know, we talk about, you know, climate change and habitat loss and, you know, and, and mega fires. Um, and yet, you know, there's, there's literally nothing that we do uh, on this planet that kills more terrestrial wild animals than drive. You know, that's, that's, that is the, the primary source of, mot of mortality for so many species, including very rare ones, you know, like ocelots and Florida panthers and tiger salamanders. You know, these are all threatened and endangered species for which road mortality is the primary source of mortality, you know, so it's not just, I mean, I think that's one of the things about, uh, you know, roadkill is that the animals, because, you know, the animals that we see tend to be the common animals, right? The squirrels and the white-tailed deer and the raccoons. Um, and so, you know, we, I think we, we overlook roadkill as truly an, ex an existential threat to, uh, you know, many uh, threatened and endangered species, but, you know, it certainly is. Yeah. And, you know, you talk, there's a great chapter in the book where you talk about also roads bisecting or disrupting aquatic habitat, particularly migrating fish. And you tell this great story of tribal leadership. I think it was in Washington state that really insisted in uh, restoring or fixing roads to enable salmon migration. Can you just talk about that both as a problem and the solution? Yeah, certainly. So the, the problem, the problem are culverts, you know, culverts are those, those little, you know, pipes, they're typically these metal corrugated pipes that funnel streams under under roadways, you know, we drive over a thousand of them every day without ever noticing them or thinking about them. And, and yet they are these huge sources of habitat loss, you know, typically they're built too narrow to accommodate the stream. So they kind of concentrate the flow of the water into this fire hose. That's very hard for fish to swim against. Uh, and, you know, as a result, salmon, you know, all over the West Coast, certainly in California, uh, have lost access to, you know, many thousands of miles of, of historic spawning habitat. And again, you know, these aren't giant concrete dams that are, you know, very conspicuous. These are all of these subtle little pipes under our roadways that are, are inflicting massive uh, habitat loss. So in, in in Washington, you know, again, another wonderful story for, for Native American Heritage Month, which you which you mentioned, Wade, um, you know, so, so there essentially this coalition of native tribes uh, sued the state uh, and essentially said, you know, hey, we signed we signed treaties back in the 19th century that promised us uh, salmon, you know, and access to salmon and by preventing salmon from spawning and, you know, reducing their populations, uh, these culverts are in violation of our treaties. You know, we don't just have the right to fish, we have the right to have fish in the streams and the, the culverts are blocking that. Uh, and, you know, essentially uh, a series of courts uh, decided in their favor, it ascended all the way to the US Supreme Court, um, you know, which which essentially ruled that the, that, uh, the tribes were right um, and that the, the state is obligated to uh, retrofit and replace uh, all of these culverts which is sort of compelling this multi-billion dollar uh, restoration program now that's going to remove hundreds of culverts um, and uh, hopefully restore access to thousands of miles of streams all over the Northwest. And that's actually happening? Those culverts are being replaced? It's actually happening. Yeah. And I got to, you know, in the course of working on this book, I got to go to one of the, the places where they, you know, they've taken out this little, uh, you know, kind of battered metal pipe and put in a big, you know, sort of open span box culvert, essentially, that allowed the stream to flow unrestricted. And they had done that, you know, a year earlier, and there were already chum salmon swimming uh, through the new culvert upstream and, you know, spawning above this historic fish barrier. So it was incredibly beautiful and uh, inspiring and uh, just a great example of progress. Oh, that's incredible. And, and, a, and a little bit later in the discussion, we'll talk about an effort in California to do just that, particularly on the North Coast. So, Ben, one of your chapters is on California, actually, and it uh, chronicles this remarkable grassroots effort to establish 
a wildlife crossing uh, right outside of Los Angeles to enable mountain lion populations to survive down there. And you interviewed perhaps the catalyst for that wildlife crossing, a woman named Beth Pratt. Um, we have Beth with us today, and we're going to ask her to join on screen. Um, Beth is a conservation hero of mine and uh, really the person who would not take no for an answer uh, to create this wildlife crossing. So, Ben, I want to first ask you, how did you how did you encounter Beth or how did you learn about her work and then decide to put her in the book? Well, it's 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 hard uh, to write about wildlife crossings without without learning about Beth. I think um, you know she's just such she's she's become such as you said an amazing catalyst for this for this this cause. And you know she's of course incredibly energetic. And you know and truly, I mean it's it's just amazing how much uh, this this project has accomplished for raising the profile of of this issue really around around the country. You know it's of course a, it's 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 an enormous, uh, remarkably ambitious crossing structure uh, in a, in an incredibly high visibility place. And you know it's really changed the it's kind of moved the goalposts I think in a lot of ways. You know I, I live in, uh, in in Colorado and you know in, in Colorado the kind of big barrier to connectivity is I-70. Uh, you know and for a long time the state I think kind of said well you know it's like it's yeah it's this you know it's this big twinned interstate highway you know 25,000 cars a day we can't really do anything about that. Um, and uh, you know and just recently I was I was up on you know sort of walking I-70 with some uh, road ecologists who were like yeah you know now that they're you know I mean, I mean now that uh, you know there's a, a wildlife crossing being built over the 101 with 300,000 cars a day and 10 lanes of traffic, you know, this actually, this project feels totally attainable, uh, you know, so, so I think, I think that's, that's really how I, 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 you know, became familiar with Beth because, you know, this project is really influencing wildlife crossings and connectivity efforts around the country. And uh, again, I think truly redefining what's possible. So people just can't stop talking about Beth, you know. <laughs> well, Beth, uh, let's turn to you. So, Obviously, a lot of people tuning in here understand the project or might even work in this area. But for those who don't, really, what is what is this wildlife crossing and why did you and so many others drive to, to, to make it a reality? Yeah, thanks, Wade. And you're a hero of mine, as you know. So lots of hero worship around here. But thank you. Uh, you know, hey, first, I want to note I was the person who's crazy enough to not take no for an answer and carry a cardboard cutout of a mountain lion around. But obviously it takes a village and partners like the National Park Service and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and Caltrans, right? I mean, really we're advocating for this, but it does, you know, to do something this crazy as we always talk about Secretary Crowfoot, you need someone crazy who can just champion it, and not take no for an answer. So I do think there's a lesson there, right? Find someone crazy like me to represent your cause and, you know, you may be able to get it there. Um, but yeah, this project and I and Ben, you do. I mean, I cannot recommend this book enough, um, not just because I'm in it, um, but uh, it really does detail this really techie kind of scientific -y project and really lift it off the page about what roads are doing to not just wildlife, but people. And I had to learn that 10 years ago um, when I was, you know, volunteered. Yeah. How hard could this crossing be? I'm happy to help. Um and but what I think, you know, this project over the 101 is so interesting because it gets at something both you, Secretary Crowfoot and Ben, you write about is we actually don't get much roadkill here. It is, you know, roadkill is one measure. But what you're looking at is this um, sort of you know, isolation, this fragmentation. The Santa Monica Mountains became an island because of the 101. Now, we didn't know we were doing that when we put the 101 in decades ago, but now we do. And as some famous person I can't remember said, uh, islands are where species go to die. And that's exactly what the National Park Service research was raising the alarm bells about, which is if we don't do something, these mountain lions are going to go extinct because of the isolation, which causes them to inbreed. Interestingly enough, what is also happening is other species are, you know, whether it be Western fence lizards or 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 birds that, um, you know, can't get across the road, like, um, you know, mountain quail and stuff they also are starting to become genetically isolated, just not as acute as the mountain lion. So this is actually even beyond most typical wildlife crossings is we're creating a habitat for all over, over, this, uh, over this freeway, which to me is really encouraging that this is becoming like a new model. It's not just about this one crossing. And the mountain lions will not now have a future down there, which to me is my moral compass, the wildlife. And this isn't a pipe dream, this is actually going to happen? 
Well, because of people like you, Secretary Crowfoot, yes, uh, who, who signed on to the crazy, right? Uh, when I got involved in um, 2012, they've been talking about it for some time. Uh, and I was out with the National Park Service biologist, Jeff Sikich, learning about P-22. Uh, and when I asked at the end of the day how I could help, he's like, well, there's this wildlife crossing we've been looking at. And, you know, me, who's an idiot, was like, sure, I'm happy to help. How hard can it be? Uh, not knowing it would be a decade and hundred million dollar project, but it's happening. There's certainly over that decade times where I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to pull this off, but we did. And I think it's one of the most hopeful projects on the planet that we are somehow enabling wildlife and one of the world's busiest freeways to coexist at the same time. And to me, that's a way forward. You can look at right now um, at 101wildlifecrossing.org. There's a live construction camera up and boy, it is going fast. Uh, you can see some of the abutments, the support structures in the middle. And then by, we think at this point, uh, mid-February, the horizontal skeleton structure is going to start going up. That is so, awesome. No longer a pipe dream. It's happening. <laughs> Incredible. You know, Ben's book, it does a really good job you know, detailing the crisis, the threat, the impact, but also this growing movement to recognize that wildlife connectivity is essential and to get it done. And you, one of the crazy things you've done recently is you took a road trip across the country on one <laughs> of these expressways to connect with people like you across the country. Can you just talk about, you know, what, what the road trip was all about, a couple of places you visited and any insights you have from that? Yeah, it was really amazing. I visited some of the sites Ben, you know, talked to for the book as well. And I was accompanied by Steve Winter, National Geographic photographer, and Sharon Gunnup, his, uh, his partner, who also has written a lot um, of environmental journalism, and then two folks from ARC Animal Road Crossings. And yeah, we basically, this is just stage one of uh, this road trip, because we want to do more part of this. And Ben gives me a really nice ending how I vowed to P-22 when he passed away that we wouldn't stop. And now I'm raising a half a billion dollars to do more. So this was part of looking at what's out there and what's great and then what's needed. And we basically did the Southern route. We have six more routes we have to do from, uh, we started at the crossing and we ended up in Florida. We basically drove the 10 and it was really exciting to see some of the really awesome stuff out there. Like everybody needs to go to San Antonio and see in Phil Hardberger Park, the incredible land bridge there for both wildlife and people. It is incredible. Um, Florida has a lot going on for the Florida Panther. We toured a lot of that. We toured New Mexico where crossings were needed for bighorn. Um, the Mojave Desert in California where the desert tortoise and bighorn. Um, if I have one takeaway or two takeaways, one is how passionate people are across the country. People knew about P-22 in Florida. People knew about P-22 in New Mexico. Um, and how wildlife crossings really are in a time where we don't agree on a lot, almost everybody supports them. Nobody wants animals to get hit by um, by cars. We also learned about pelican poles, which are poles that help the pelicans fly high enough over the, the road so they don't get hit. But the second piece, a little more in the weeds, was in Florida, they're doing these raised roadways, which you can't do everywhere. We couldn't have done it uh, for the wallace Annenberg crossing, but where you can do them they don't just put a thin crossing. They erase the road from the landscape. Uh, one of these raised roadways was over a, almost a mile. You just take the road out of the equation and the animals have all this habitat. And indeed, one we were touring, they were the scientists and Caltrans that were telling us, yeah, a lot of bears used to get hit here. And as we're staying there, a bear walks under the raid, raised roadway. Oh, wow. So I think raised roadways are something of the future where they can be applied. Uh, give not just a little bridge for wildlife, but give the habitat back to them. That is amazing. Yeah, I want to bring into the conversation our fourth and final guest today, and that is my colleague and friend, Chuck Bonham, Woo! who leads our, our Department of Fish and Wildlife. And Chuck, as you come on screen, I'll give you a moment here. Um, Chuck was initially, uh, Chuck's probably, you know, connected with Ben through this book, uh, yeah. on beavers. And Chuck's department has led this true sort of total reform of our of our policies to manage beavers in California. And now, you know, Ben, your book is playing something uh, quite similar uh, to with with uh, with Chuck, uh, or at least with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is really providing a rocket booster to something that he's passionate about that we're working on. So Chuck, welcome. 
Um, I want to first just ask you for a little bit more on sort of how you encounter this issue, both as a as an environmentalist, a conservationist, and the Department of, of Fish and Wildlife leader. Thanks, Wade and Ben, Beth. It's great to see friends. I was joking with Ben. He's got like six, seven more books that he could write about CDFW. So we're, this is like a symbiotic relationship for sure. <laughs> um. Hey, I I come at this trying to break what I think is a conventional wisdom that occurs in wildlife management that we're not supposed to talk about animals in a way that strikes personal passion. And I, I think that's understandable in a lot of ways, but not fully caught up to the 21st century. And the reality is, People since the beginning of time have been expressing their connections to animals in, in all kinds of ways, art, drama, dance, advocacy. And when I read, and I'm just starting it, I've got a long flight to Washington, D.C. next week, Ben. I plan on finishing your second book then. What I'm finding is this idea of wildlife crossings dials back to one simple word, which is connectivity. And all of life needs connection. I mean, if you look at social sciences and medicine, the benefits to people from social networks are huge, mental health, physical health. And when we as people understand things that benefit us, connection is identical to something that benefits animals, connections, then I think we start to appreciate more and more how closely aligned our futures are, and that the providing of connectivity is essential to these species in a challenging future. Hmm. So. I want to I want to stick stay with that that topic or that thought on emotional connection with animals. You know, like a lot of people, I'm I'm, I'm a parent of a young kid, and um, it's heartbreaking to you know experience your watch your daughter actually see roadkill for the first time and yeah. to understand that, you know, that animal is dead because of cars like your own. And Ben, you have this remarkable chapter in your book about Tasmania of all places, just off Australia and how there's this network of wildlife carers um, that are actually uh, taking in wounded animals because the rate of, of auto animal collisions is so intense on that Island. Can you t and I and I appreciated you bringing that dimension in that there's this sort of human connection to the to the you know uh, not only to animals but to the pain and the and their impacts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. You know, so so Tasmania, like you know all all of Australia, uh, is populated by marsupials, right? And marsupials, uh, you know, the females raise their joeys, their babies, in you know, kind of a frontal pouch. And so what what often happens there is that you know, female wombats and wallabies and, you know, and, and, uh, and possums and other, other critters will get hit by cars uh, and the baby will actually survive uh, in, in the pouch. And uh, there's this amazing network of, I mean, literally hundreds of people in this very small island state who drive around, uh, you know, Tasmania's roads looking for dead marsupials and extracting the babies within and then hand raising them to adulthood, which can take years, uh, you know, for some species like, like wombats. And, and, you know, I just found that so powerful because, you know, I, I think as, you know, as both uh, Chuck and Wade, you're alluding to, you know, I think, I think that, you know, we have this deep seated connection with, with wildlife and yet roadkill is something that we typically look away from uh, or don't notice. You know, we drive past so many carcasses every day that they're essentially invisible to us and we we kind of habituate to them. Uh, so, I, you know, I just I just found it so inspiring to go to a place where people actually seek roadkill out, you know, where they, they, they pay tribute to these animals and look for them and notice them uh, in a, a really profound, um, passionate way. And, you know, I just I just found that uh, kind of a, a beautiful model of, of relating to the animals that uh, we're unfortunately killing. Yeah, and your book does such a good job at profiling people that took matters into their own hands. You've got another part of the book that people are helping with an actual frog migration across a, a road at night. I want to give a shout out to a fellow California, Fraser Schilling, and the Roadkill Observation Network. Um, Fraser was, you know, this is sort of crowdsourced collection of information on roadkill 
that's really identifying where uh, habitat connectivity is being disrupted. And long before agencies like ours uh, were actually, or maybe you know, more effectively than agencies like ours were measuring these, um, these mortalities, uh, uh, people like Fraser were developing networks to do just that. So um, that's really, really uh, exciting. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just I'll just briefly I'll briefly add that, that Fraser and uh, and uh, UC Davis are putting on a wildlife crossings conference uh, in in the spring that uh, I'll, I'll be speaking at, and probably a lot of you folks will be uh, attending as well. Oh, so good. I'll we'll challenge our colleague Gita. We'll challenge our colleague Gita to find a, a web link on that while on the UC. What would UC Davis would it? What, what what's the conference? She already name? has it up. She's oh, yeah. watching. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. And, wait. Wait, if I can add, you know, onto or onto this, uh, I think that there's a moral cost to driving for both wildlife and people that we haven't grappled with, right? I mean, just on the people side, what are we losing in California? Over 4,000 people a year to our roadways, to say nothing of the tens of thousands of injuries. And if that was any other cause, it would be a public health crisis, right? Um for wildlife, I, you know, I got into this on the very biological side of it. Um, you know, these mountain lions were going extinct and I talked in, you know, we talk a lot about road ecology and fragmentation and all these, but uh, I had an experience up near me where a bobcat got hit by a car. And I actually went out and sat with that bobcat. A neighborhood called me. And this is one of the main thoroughfares to Yosemite and thought the bobcat was going to die. But I was sitting there on the road, five feet, you know, there's this blonde woman crying next to a bobcat and people didn't even slow for a human. Now, there's a happy ending here where I actually got him to a rescue. He now, Billy the Bobcat, lives. He had to have his leg amputated so he can't go back to the wild. But he was one of the lucky ones. But to watch his suffering, mm. it became even more than just solving this connectivity program. These animals suffer as well as people on our roads. So I think that that is something we have not grappled with as a society. And you even touch on this in your book, Ben, that Wildlife crossings will only get us so far. We're going to have to drive less. We're going to have to figure out this transportation thing. And, you know, on the emotional side, you know, back to what, what Chuck was saying, I think, you know, what P22 really showed was that side too, that there is a cost to this that the scientific papers do not get at, which is this yeah. lonely mountain lion trapped in the middle of a city who in the end was done in by the lack of connectivity yeah. as well. And then if you take, Beth's movement, which is so many, and you hear a young child use their own words to say what it meant to lose that animal, then you realize that's the energy that matters at the political level as much as anything. And I think Ben's book also illustrates this is a totally, totally 200% fixable problem. Yep. It's just time and money combined with motivation, which comes from a movement of people. And in a world of climate change, these animals, wildlife, they basically have three choices, right? They can adapt, they can die, they can move. And we are the ones that can fix their movement by making sure they can and it works. I mean, the facts speak for themselves. You can go to, you know, Oregon and look at 97, US 97 and see 85% success rate in reducing collisions. You can go to Wyoming along Highway 30 and see 81% success rate. I mean, it just, it flat out works and it's fixable. So Chuck, on that note, what are we doing about it? I mean, our agencies and our state's transportation agencies have accountability to not only recognize the problem, but work to resolve yeah. it. How would you describe what we're doing on both the land side and, and on the water side? Yeah, I think we're doing things at a legislative level, at a technical level, and at a funding level. So legislatively, California has been on a strong march, you know, probably over the last 10 years. You go back to 2005, we've got a Senate bill, I think it's 857, that directs Caltrans to identify every fish passage barrier kind of in the coastal zone, so to speak, along the state highway system, and then get on a work plan to remediate. Our department manages a fish passage barrier database, which is just like super robust, rich, and user-friendly for any Californian agency or public 
you get to 2021 and we've got a new bill, Senate Bill 970, 790, excuse me, that creates a new like incentive financially for developers and transportation to get mitigation credits when their development projects include connectivity proponent, you know, prongs. And then you get to just last year, and we've got another bill that's directing Caltrans with our state department each year to assess the whole highway system and inventory wildlife passage feature priorities. And CDFW is the second year into like a top 60 kind of prioritization around the state. So that's like legislatively. Then we're with all kinds of partners running massive data mapping efforts. Some of this comes out of that ungulate, you know, large mammal. We now have these storyboard, really nice visuals available on our website showing all of our key mule deer herds, Loyalton and down in, um, you know, best neck of the woods, the Jawbone Ridge. And then you can visually see the movement of the animals interlaid with this um, intricate kind of road system. And then that helps you figure out what we're doing next in California, which is funding. You've got to find the money and put it on the problem. The Wallace Annenberg one is a great example, but open your aperture. Next year, we're also taking out the last three dams in the Klamath River, which itself is connectivity, 420 miles of habitat. We're next spring and summer, I think, Wade, project you standing on I-15 between Las Vegas and Los Angeles, where we've got iconic bighorn sheep on either side and mountain lions and others. And we're going to put three overcrossings over the highway in conjunction with high-speed rail connecting Las Vegas to Los Angeles in time for the Olympics. So our department in two years is just spending $90 million alone on wildlife corridors, which when you think about it, the bipartisan infrastructure law put Beth, I want to say it's like 300 million 350, into, the, yeah, 350, into the federal highway administration on like a spend plan from now to 2026. And our little department's just doing 90 million. So at the end of the day, this stuff is fixable and it's nonpartisan. Like it's literally yeah. nonpartisan. It's just a matter of energy, motivation, creativity, money, and time. And Chuck, and you, that, that long flight to DC next week is taking you to testify before Congress on this topic. Yes. I actually was with a colleague of yours from the state of Wyoming, which doesn't necessarily share the same politics as our state. Yep. And we're really fortunate that the chair of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works subcommittee which is a mouthful, on fisheries, water, and wildlife is our senior Senator Padilla. But the ranking member is Senator Loomis from Wyoming. And my sense is this is a completely nonpartisan hearing about we share common ground in doing infrastructure that's good for wildlife. Yeah. Can I just add, uh, Secretary Crawford, real quickly to, to Chuck's point? My own organization, National Wildlife Federation, very bipartisan. We do work in Wyoming. We do work in Cal. And yeah, we've we've just seen that the cooperation, it, it is not a partisan issue. The other thing I just wanted to call out to all, you know, to California, the other thing about that road trip was the takeaway is everybody's like, oh, my God, your state. How do we get that cooperation? Everything from your agency such a code crow for it. Chuck, you're, you've always been all in. You spoke at P22's memorial. You have this new paradigm. Governor Newsom himself and Caltrans. I mean, Caltrans, Director Taveras spoke at P22's memorial, but also wants to do more crossings. I'll tell you, that is not universally what a lot of these states are enjoying for cooperations on connectivity. So California really does lead the way there under all your leadership. And the rest of the, some of the other states are jealous. So I just want to uh, let you know that. You make my job easy. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a team effort. Listen, I want to get to some of the questions that are being put in. And if you have a question, you can tap the Q&A button and ask, and ask it. But I do want to just say that this book, Ben, you do a great job towards the end, really talking about the international dimension of this and the fact that there is a lot of infrastructure being built around the world. And uh, China's big international investment, I think it's called the Belt and Road Initiative, is investing across the world. And so 
you really talk about, you call it a tsunami of infrastructure. And I'm just interested in, you know, maybe a little bit of reflection on, you know, what gives you hope given the fact that, you know, all of this, these new roads and this new infrastructure is going in, or do you have hope given that? Yeah, I, I have intermittent hope, I would say, uh, you know, given that we know that, you know, the infrastructure tsunami, which is really um, Bill Lawrence's term, uh, you know, it's it's I mean, it's really the primary threat to, you know, name a species of charismatic megafauna internationally from, you know, Asian elephants to tigers to gorillas, you know, new infrastructure is is jeopardizing their survival. So, you know, given that backdrop, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to feel hopeful, but there are also amazing examples of, of, you know, sort of innovation uh, in, uh, you know, in the developing world. You know, one of the, the issues, I think, is that here in the U.S., we have this really entrenched infrastructure that's hard, you know, all, all we can do is retrofit it, right? We, we're, we're sort of stuck with it uh, in a big way, whereas other countries that are building their infrastructure really for the first time can learn from our mistakes and do it right to begin with. You know, those elevated roadways that Beth was talking about, you know, those are, there are incredible projects in Kenya and India uh, where roadways are elevated for many, many miles as they pass through uh, critical habitats. You know, I visited uh, a road in Brazil uh, that had been engineered to be really sinuous, lots of hairpin turns, but also sort of rolling along the y-axis um, like a roller coaster. So you couldn't drive fast on it at all. It was a, a highway through a, a park that was engineered to force its users to, to go no faster than 30 miles an hour or so. And, and that's more radical in its way than you know anything we've we've done in the US. So you know I think as as this sort of road ecology movement goes international. Uh, you know, there are some examples of, of tropical innovation um, that uh, are, are in some ways in their creativity outstripping uh, even what we're doing uh, here, in, here in the U.S. And that gives me some hope. That, that's, that is good to hear. Um, one question from Bettina is underpassings versus overpass or, or underpass crossings versus overpass. Um, are they equally effective? Can you just talk, Ben, about what you learned about just sort of the diversity of the crossings that are needed? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, different species, of course, have different crossing requirements. And, you know, there are some that certainly prefer overpasses. You know, pronghorn are kind of the archetypal overcrossers. They're really fast and, uh, you know, fa the fastest terrestrial animal uh, in, in the U.S. or mammal, at least. Um, and uh, they've got incredible vision, right? So they want to be out in the open. They don't want to be in a, you know, a box culvert. They want to be up on a the open deck of a bridge. So, you know, species like that, um, you know, typically prefer overpasses. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, the, the the terrain and the topography and the, the freeway itself uh, often determines um, the uh, sort of the, the choice of structure. And, and I mean, maybe Beth could talk a little bit about why uh, the Liberty Canyon crossing is an overpass and not a giant tunnel. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, you answered it. Every crossing is specific to the geography that it's being put on in what species you want to. Overpass will get the most wildlife. And that's why we're doing a fully formed overpass for all. And also how you design the overpass can make a lot. But yeah, if you're just wanting to do, you know, oscillates in South Texas, then, you know, box culverts, retrofitting is great for that animal. So there's really no right answer. It's all, as you said, Ben, depending on what it is you're trying to do and where. Yeah, I'll give you a great example here in California of just like thinking about the particular place for the benefit you seek. Uh, a lot of people have driven from San Jose to Santa Cruz. You go Highway 17, and there's a pretty infamous curve called the Laurel Curve. Mount lines, I think, generally like prefer open spaces, don't like to be trapped in confined spaces, particularly certain hours a day. But this curve is almost a real sharp hairpin. And what we found with Caltrans is if you are going to elevate it at some, which it's tending to do anyway, you have a big open space underneath it anyway, and you can cultivate, curate that for actually a mountain line crossing. So lo and behold, go down there and drive it today. And there's a mountain line crossing underneath it. That's Caltrans. This is the first project our department ever gave Caltrans credit for in mitigation banking. And our local land trust in Santa Cruz has acquired properties on the other sides to make sure there's a you know, the funneling of open space into the, and it's working. And Chuck, wasn't that the one where one of the first days there was actually a bobcat or a mountain lion yes. that was walking through it? Yes. And Beth, here's an idea for your next fundraiser. When we went, 
for the groundbreaking, the land trust had made little cookies of the undercrossing with little mountain lions going underneath it. I ate it. I took a photo. I'll send you the photo oh, so you can do it for photo. your next fundraiser. I'm always and, good with cookies. I will say so. also like talking the the geographic restrictions. We actually looked at a tunnel and ruled, ruled it out a because it was not going to benefit as many species, but two we would have had to close the 101 freeway for like a year to do a tunnel because you would you can't even drill it and i think we would have lost all support for the project <laughs> Got it. hey eva has a question about data mapping is, is data mapping of animal movement available to the public and i'll add to that chuck if people want to understand what are priority areas of connectivity i think you guys also put a study out but chuck can you talk about where this information exists yeah i couldn't give you the like precise long but anyone watching just Google, you know, CDFW wildlife connectivity story map, and you're going to end up in our web universe with those storyboard visuals I was talking about for deer herds. And then you're in the portal and you can find our recently published uh, update of priority barriers to fix. And then I know both Beth and Ben sit on top of their own kind of social um, data sources, and these things are available. They're available at the federal level, Department of the Interior. Um, it's just a, a rich and emerging, you know, data source. Yeah, great, great question, um, or great answer, I should say. Um, Sally is part of the, um, oh, hang on, I'm just going to find it here. Uh, oh, there's so many good questions. Let me ask this one. I'm going to ask one from April. Um, she's a student of climate justice and social science. In terms of building public and political will to make the changes necessary that we're talking about, what, in your view, is the best framing for folks to grasp and actually care about in the long term? She says speciesism is a concept she thinks about a lot. So really, as we're trying to build this movement, Ben, what have you what you know, what are sort of key arguments that you've seen working across the country or the world? Well, you know, I really think it depends on on the audience you're talking to. You know, if your if your goal is to convince, you know, a, a cost conscious transportation engineer at a state DOT that these projects are worth pursuing, you know, I think the financial argument makes a lot of sense, right? The fact that wildlife crossings tend to be self funding by preventing, uh, you know, expensive and dangerous collisions. Uh, you know, if you're talking to you know the hunt, uh, 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 the hunting lobby. Uh, you know it's it's uh, it's the ma it's the maintenance of healthy deer and elk herds. You know, I mean, I feel like wildlife crossings are you know one of the few issues that are equally supported by hunters and the humane society, right? Um, you know, if you're if you're talking to animal rights folks, you know, maybe it's the aversion of suffering um, that uh, that that Beth has has uh, talked talked about really eloquently. Um, so you know, I think that's the, kind of the beauty of this issue is there's there's there truly is something in it for every audience. Uh, and I think, you know, there's there's a, an argument to be tailored for every audience. And I think P, the P-22 connection really shows how people connected to P-22 differently, right? Whether it be mural art or a hip hop song or scientists, but he connected us to each other around a common cause. So I, I was just rewriting the preface for my book, When Mountain Lines and Neighbors, for a new edition. And I was like, to me, my advice when people ask, and you know, Wade, you know this, hey, find your crazy, but find your P22, whether it's your neighborhood animal or a statewide animal or something that does connect people around a love of something that then leads to action. Yeah. I want to give voice to a connection that you, Beth, have made and Ben has made, and that is the role of highways in separating communities. Yes. Um, and particularly the role of highways. Um, destroying communities of color historically across the country. Ben, can you share a little bit more about the chapter that you wrote on Syracuse, New York, and the fact that as we're focusing on, on protecting animals from roads, we also have to redress these historic wrongs that roads did to human communities? Yeah, you know, I, I think this this gets at Chuck's point about how the you know the fact that we look we're all we're all kind of in it together, you know, us and, and non human animals alike, and roads affect us in analogous ways, right? We are we we too are hit by cars and afflicted by noise pollution and air pollution, and uh, you know the same uh, the same giant interstate highways that uh, divide our ecosystems also divide human communities, and uh, you know oftentimes those those mid century urban freeways were very deliberately weaponized against communities of color, and we're used by urban planners to wipe out neighborhoods that were perceived as undesirable. Uh, and, you know, and today the, the legacy of, of, uh, of that, those 
historic wrongs lingers, you know, and, and those communities of color are disproportionately likely to be adjacent to freeways and to suffer from, uh, you know, asthma and cancer and other uh, maladies caused by air pollution. Um, so in Syracuse, you know, that's kind of, an, again, another archetypal example, a place where I-81 uh, was the interstate that was basically plowed through uh, the 15th Ward, a historic Black community, very intentionally uh, and displaced thousands of, uh, of, of residents. Uh, and the community is still afflicted by this giant, you know, concrete monstrosity. And, you know, there the, the plan is to essentially tear down that viaduct and replace it with uh, kind of a, an urban boulevard that will have uh, houses and businesses and green space and other other uh, amenities. And, you know, that's a, uh, you know, multi a multi-billion dollar project. It's going to take uh, many years, certainly, but I think is is evidence that these historic, oftentimes racist mistakes that we made, you know, in the middle of the 20th century are not necessarily permanent, you know, that our, mm -hmm. our infrastructure isn't always forever. And we can redress those wrongs, just like dam removal on the Klamath River. Mm -hmm. You know, I had Beth come and speak to our agency uh, leaders across our agency last week. And Beth, you played an incredible music video um, of uh, some friends you've met in this journey and it's, if you can find the link to it, uh, or Gita can find the link to it to share to this group, it's amazing, but it just draws the connection between the uh, impacts of, of, of freeways and black communities and how that, you know, relates to, you know, the work that you're doing. Um, we yeah, just have she, a few, yeah. She shared it, it's there. And yeah, it does, this was by a um, hip hop artist, Warren Dixon from Watts, and who better than Watts to know how these freeways disrupt communities, right? And yeah. so to them, P22 represents a social justice issue. And this video shows that, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, anybody who's watching, do yourself a favor and just get this, get this link. And if you can't watch it right after this, just put it on your browser and watch it later. It is deeply impactful. Um, we just have a few minutes and like like a lot of times, there's a lot of specific questions coming in that we're not going to be able to answer. But I want to just give each of you an opportunity <clears throat> to share uh, maybe final thoughts that you have looking to the future. You know, what um, you know, what uh, what makes you hopeful or what what is what does success look like here in 10 or 20 years? The you know, more concrete, uh, the better. I shouldn't say concrete necessarily, but uh uh, so maybe let me start with you, Ben, you know, and, and maybe any reflections on the journey of, of your book writing this. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I mean, you know, my my primary reflection on the journey is just that I'm, I'm so grateful that it can be that it can be helpful to people like you, Wade and Chuck and Beth, who are, you know, who are actually on the, the front lines and uh, changing our infrastructure and, and making the uh, the world a better place for humans and wildlife alike. So it means a lot to me that to know that this book, uh, both of the books have been have been useful in that in that process. So I'm very grateful for that. You know, as for as for the future, I mean, you know, it really is all about funding. I think that's you know, that's that's it. That's the whole that the whole game in a lot of respects. And, you know, Chuck mentioned that $350 million in, you know, in the federal uh, infrastructure uh, law. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a good start. Um, but it's, you know, truly a tiny fraction of what we need um, to redress all of the, uh, you know, barriers to connectivity and roadkill collision uh, hotspots out, out there. And so, you know, I'd, I'd like to imagine that, uh, you know, that, that, Funding has, you know, sort of put this issue on the radar, and has certainly compelled lots of states to bring their own money to the table. But you know, it truly is a fraction of what we ultimately need uh, around around the country. And and so I'm I'm looking forward to seeing more funding sources, uh, including pi private philanthropy, thanks to thanks to uh, Beth's Wildlife Crossings Fund, uh, come online here in the next few years. Mm. Beth, what what you you live this? This is you know a huge personal passion of yours. Uh, key, key, key final insights or takeaways for the, gosh, over 300 people that have joined us today. Yeah. Well, for us, just grateful for operating in a state with leaders like you, Wade and Chuck, who make this possible. Again, we, you know, that is not enjoyed other places. Grateful to who I'm calling the, the poet laureate of, um, uh, road ecology, uh, Ben Goldfarb. Uh, no, seriously, we talk a lot. We have the science around this, right? We know how to do it, but it's that social, movement we need and, and books like Ben's really help with that, whether it be with beavers or with rotor crossings. But I'm hopeful we're going to get this done. I think that this private philanthropy angle, which you know worked with the Wallace Annenberg crossing because of people like Wallace Annenberg, um, is the model that is going to get us to the place before the permanent fix. The permanent fix is, of course, these are just embedded in budgets, but 
we can use this private philanthropy model to drive more in California and beyond. And I'm really hopeful that we are going to get a lot done quickly because of that. So mm. yes to that. Chuck. This will probably get me fired. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and it may get me really the stink eye from our department of finance, but what the heck. Like just pie in the sky, you know, California is like no other place anywhere. The unrivaled diversity of who we are as people, as wildlife, as our economy. Like, I don't know. Let's pick an even number. Let's get a billion dollars. And by the time my son graduates from high school, which is six years from now, Let's fix every single barrier priority we've identified at CDFW. And it's my personal pet peeve. Let's do the world's largest culvert replacement program from Oregon to Baja in the coastal zone. And I'll give Caltrans a statutory exemption under CEQA if we can get to that kind of scale and that kind of pace. Wow. Well, you may get fired, but you're 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 well loved <laughs> among these uh, among our participants here today because you're getting the emoji love. Um, no, and in all seriousness, I mean it's going to be that scale that's gonna that's gonna you know a, really provide the solution to the problem. And I'll say um, that we really do have partners with Caltrans and our transportation secretary. They're leaning in with us. And to your point, Beth, we have to make this part of transportation budgets. It can't be an afterthought years or decades later. Um, I want to give uh, so much thanks to all of you who are in your own ways doing the work in your communities. There's great questions coming in and uh, from places like the leaders of the Chileno Valley Newt Brigade, um, which is protecting uh, newts in, in Marin County. There are local leaders across the state doing this work. And Chuck, a lot of questions coming in around how can local groups tap into re to, to financial resources so uh, an area of follow-up is to really help the folks that are already out there doing it and sometimes taking matters into their own hands, get more institutionalized support from us. Um, amazing conversation, uh, Ben. Thank you for uh, all that you do. Uh, I won't put you on the spot and ask what your next book is, but uh, we're looking forward to it, whatever it is. Um, and let me then turn and just uh, conclude by saying, uh, thanks again for joining. We usually have an ending slide that provides an email uh, if you have any questions or uh, input. Oh, uh, we're, there is just another reminder for Native American Heritage Month, great events, um, and the link that Gita just put up. Please check those out. Got some great conversations. And then as always, if you have suggestions around future discussions or specific questions coming out of this discussion, please email us on screen. Um, ben, Beth, Chuck, thanks for the, all the work you do. We will, we will continue to make progress uh, on behalf of uh, Californians and this incredible nature and all the animals. So thank you. Thanks. We'll see you later. Bye bye.